Well, if you've ever been to the Louvre Museum here in the French capital, you know that that tremendous museum is home to some of the greatest works of art ever produced. The Louvre boasts the largest collection of art on the planet, and protecting that collection is no small feat. Well, here to tell us a bit more about the role the Louvre plays as keeper of art treasures and cultural heritage is the director of Paris Muse. Paris Muse, a group of art historians and educators leading private tours in Paris. Her name is Inga Lena. Inga, hello. Hi, Jeannie. Great to have you back here. Thanks on the for set. having me back. Now, you want to talk to us today about the most incredible, it's something out of a movie, ambitious project to it try sure and save is. this great collection of art, which was d at the Louvre during the occupation of World War II. That's right. So as you know, Jeannie, Paris was an occupied city from 1940 to 1944. And one of the many challenges of this time was protecting its world-class collections of art. Now, the director of national museums at the time was Jacques Jojard. And Jojard believed that art was the heritage of all of humanity. He believed that it was a physical memory of so many civilizations and ages, and to lose that memory would be an unspeakable tragedy. So he set out to orchestrate a mass exodus of the treasures of the Louvre, and he did the whole thing in secret. Now, to move art in times of peace without the threat of war looming is already a challenge, but to do so in near total silence is really nothing less than a Herculean feat. So what did Jojal do exactly? Well, even before war broke out, he started preparing for the worst. He ordered the doors of the museum to be closed, and he literally started moving house. Crate after crate was filled with the art treasures of the Louvre, which were then loaded onto convoys and sent off into the, into the French countryside to locations that were top secret, of course, far from cities, far from railway lines, and therefore out of harm's way. In a single night alone, in the summer of 1939, 800 paintings were taken out of their frames and rolled up. The halls of the Louvre looked like a battleground, with all of these empty frames lying around like cadavers. And in the end, close to 4,000 paintings will leave the museum. Well, now there's no way that one man, this Mr. Jojac, could have done that Certainly all by not. himself. <laughs> uh, who helped him do it? Well, there are about 200 people from Louvre, stra Louvre staff working, along with students from the École du Louvre, the school at the Louvre, and backup staff from the former Samaritaine department store. And they were working around the clock. Some of them even slept in the museum. Talk about dedication, because it wasn't only paintings that had to go. There were statues. There were Greek and Roman and Egyptian antiquities. There were drawings, tapestries, furniture, not to mention the art archives and the books, and nobody knew when these works were coming back or even if they were ever coming back. So how did they keep track of all of those thousands of pieces of work that were being removed? That's a very good question. The logistics of such an ambitious operation alone are enough to make you shudder. And you couldn't very well just write the names of these artworks on their crates because some of them were coveted by the invading army. So there was a system of colored dots that was devised. Most of the works at the Louvre got a green dot. The really important stuff got a yellow dot, and the prized possessions of the Louvre got a red dot. And even the number of dots meant something. So a work could be attrib attributed one, two, or even up to three red dots. And I would be willing to bet, Jeannie, that you can probably guess what the pride and joy of the Louvre Museum, the very famous Italian Renaissance portrait by Leonardo da Vinci, a portrait of Lisa Gherardini, the otherwise known as the Mona Lisa. <laughs> I'd be willing to bet that you can guess how many and what color dot she got how on her crate. How many did she get? Of course, three <laughs> red dots and just the letters LP on her crate for Louvre paintings. So where did the Mona Lisa end up spending the years of the so war? So her whereabouts during the war years were top secret, but we now know that she went to five different locations, mostly to Chateau in the south and the southwest of France. She was a masterpiece on the move, like so many others. All right, I have been to the Louvre. I've seen some of these paintings. They are massive. What, talk to us about the difficulties in, of getting them out of their frames, moving them safely. That's right. So not all of the paintings could be taken out of their frames. Some of them were simply too fragile to be rolled, but some of them were simply too big. Uh, you've probably seen these large format paintings. So many of them were actually moved as is in their frames vertically. And it was the Comédie Française, the famous playhouse in Paris that lent the museum these big trucks that they used to transfer their, their stage sets. And there's a funny story behind um, a particular painting by a French romantic artist called Jericho. The name of the painting is Raft of the Medusa. It's 15 feet high, about 23 feet wide. It was moved as is in its frame, and it got ensnared in the trolley wires outside of the city of Versailles, causing a short circuit and plunging the entire city into darkness. You can see some images from that painting just behind That's you now. Right. What about heavier works? What about things like statues? Well, the very last work to be moved to safety, Jeannie, in the museum is the very famous 
famous uh, Greek Hellenistic statue known as the Winged Victory of Samothrace, or if you call her by her Greek name, Nike. Mm -hmm. She stands at 10 feet tall, weighing several metric tons, and she graces the top of this very grand staircase at the Louvre. And to move her down to a safer spot, a wooden ramp was especially outfitted for her. She was lassoed with ropes, lifted on a crane, and Louvre staff stood there and watched with bated breath as she glided down this staircase. Mm -hmm. It was September the 3rd, 1939, 3 o'clock p.m., the exact moment that war broke out. It's incredible that you can see her today there as she, she stands at the yes. top of that staircase in the Louvre. Now, apparently, the Louvre is about to undertake another kind of evacuation. Uh, That's right. Uh, under much happier circumstances, That's right. So it's no longer the threat of war that is looming, thankfully, but the threat of Mother Nature. You may know that the Louvre is actually built on the banks of the river Seine, and the Seine has a habit of flooding every now and then. The last great flood was in 1910. Here are some images of when Paris literally became a Venice. People had to be rescued from their homes. Uh, and if this happens again, we're in 2015 right now. Scientists say we're a little bit overdue for some centennial flooding. And if this happens again, it would be catastrophic for the Louvre because most of its reserve collections are in areas that are considered at risk for flooding. So the Louvre is having a brand new conservation and storage facility built outside of Paris which it plans to move off the better part of its reserve collections to. So as you can see, Jeannie, the Louvre is actually continuing in its role as the custodian of cultural heritage and the protector of some of the greatest art treasures known to mankind. It's such fascinating stuff. Inga Lena, thank you so much thank for coming you, in and sharing your expertise. My Inga, who's the director of Paris Muse, Paris Muse, that does wonderful private art tours throughout Paris. Be sure to check out their website, parismuse.com.